Ave Maria. The miracle of Cana, the first of our Lord's miracles, is important for many reasons. It sets the tone of our Lord's ministry. Whilst he has a plan, he permits us to interject ourselves in his plan, and he will actually change his plan for our benefit. <coughs> now, we've heard the miracle of the water being changed to wine many times, and every time we hear it, something new strikes us. If we look in the context of which the miracle occurred, or at least what preceded the miracle, we see another facet of what our Lord has done. Our Lord had been baptized by John in the Jordan. He then went into the wilderness, and there he was tempted. So he spent 40 days. He then returns to the Jordan, and John, given John an opportunity to proclaim him as the Son of God. And John does this twice after the baptism. The first time, as our Lord comes, our St. John says, Behold the Lamb of God. The second time, in fact, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, and he goes on to say, This is the one who I said came before me, although um, I, I'm after him. Um, I, although I came first, he's the one who comes because he was before me. And then the second time, John is there with two of his disciples. And as our Lord is passing this time, John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the two apostles of John, the two disciples of John, follow our Lord. And our Lord says, what, what do you want? He said, where do you live? They came and saw. One of them, we told, was Andrew. So Andrew is the first disciple by name of our Lord. Andrew, the next day, goes and finds brother Simon. He brings Simon to the Lord. The Lord says, you are Simon, you will be called Peter. See first. So our Lord then has two disciples. We're then told that, that um, James, was, John was a, a disciple. Well, John was a friend of Andrew, and that he, John, had a brother whom he also brought to our Lord. So our Lord had four disciples. Our Lord continues to walk along. He meets Philip. So he has five disciples. Philip calls Nathaniel six disciples. And then they, this happens to the Jordan. And now the seven of them are going back to Nazareth. But our Lord crosses over the sea, the Tiberias, and he ends up in Bethsaida. And he's going to now walk to Nazareth. But they stopped, they, he decides to go through Cana, which isn't far from Nazareth. Because Our Lady was not in Nazareth. She had been invited, as we heard, to the wedding in Cana. So, of course, our Lord would go to Cana. And that's why St. John says, the mother of Jesus was there. This, at that time, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And then Jesus was also invited. Well, of course, he's going to be invited now because he just turned up. What does St. Paul say? Offer hospitality. So even if someone comes unexpectedly, show hospitality. So he is now invited, and St. John says, Jesus was also invited and his disciples to the marriage. So here, seven men turn up for the wedding. What do you expect? Of course the wine is going to run out. They won't, have been, they won't have expected. And so the wine failing, Our Lady is embarrassed on behalf of the bride and groom. 
because to run out of food and to run out of wine was a great humiliation in Jewish culture. So Our Lady is conscious of this, and she recognizing, in quotes, that Our Lord was partly responsible for this by turning up with six men, not just six men, six fishermen, who no doubt like wine, and so she turns to him and says, they have no wine. You've come to the wedding and there's no wine. And our Lord's answer, again, we go within the context. Because in English, it sounds offensive. It sounds rude. He, says, he said to a woman, what is that to me and to thee? My hour is not yet come. But in the Aramaic, in the Jewish culture, our Lord uses exceedingly polite language, which would better be better translated in English. My lady, what concern is that of ours? What business? Why should we interfere? And he goes on to say, my time is not yet come. Well, when was his time? According to the divine plan, our Lord probably intended to reveal his glory in Jerusalem. After all, this was where he would redeem us, and it was fitting that he should be manifested in Jerusalem. And so his intention was to do that in Jerusalem. But he's going to postpone it. He would go to Jerusalem later, and he would cleanse the temple, which is where he would manifest his divinity because he would upset the, the, coin, the tables of the coin changers, the money changers, and so on. And he would cast out the animals, and nobody would touch him, which is the indication of his divine power. He's manifesting his power, his divinity. <coughs> so this was his intention. But because of his mother's intervention, um, he says, my hour is not yet come. His mother understands and says, do whatever he tells you. And so we notice, first of all, here, Our Lady manifests herself, first of all, as Mother of Mercy. Because mercy is essentially that quality by which we feel the embarrassment, the tribulations, the sorrow, the grief of others, and do something about it. It's not sufficient just to feel it. That's not of much benefit to those who suffer. But it means we must do something about it. And so she does something about it. She appeals to her son. Now, again, we notice something else about Our Lady, is that she's virgin most prudent. She doesn't tell him what to do. She only presents the problem to him. St. Paul says, we don't know how to pray. We don't know what to pray for. And therefore, we don't tell God how to solve our problem. You know, we, but rather, we present him the problem. This is how it is. And then he will work things out. And God works things out for us in the natural way. That is, the, the events around us, the people around us, the circumstances around us will work things out. St. Paul says, for those who love God, all things work for their glory, for their salvation. So there's no, with God, there's no such thing as good and evil. Whatever misfortune, whatever tribulation, whatever sorrow, whatever grief that comes our way, in God's plan, there is a greater good, a greater benefit, a greater blessing. St. Augustine says that um, God permits evil because he's powerful enough to bring good out of it. And so the troubles, the afflictions, and so on of life are simply there to strengthen our faith. And so Our Lady who knows this so well, simply says to servants, do whatever he tells you. No matter how stupid it may sound, do it. And of course, that requires faith. So her last words, this is the last time Our Lady speaks in Scripture. She utters not another word. She says everything that we need to know. Do whatever he tells you. And... St. John goes on to describe the circumstances. There were six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purifying of the Jews. So 
<coughs> so these stone pots were kept in the courtyard it to be filled with water because according to purification rites when Jews would travel or when they came from the market or when they were outside when they entered into the house they washed, they purified themselves, they washed their hands and they washed their feet this is a purification rite, it was always done and so you'd need a lot of water so we're told there's six stone jars why stone? well, if we go back to Exodus wasn't there a rock on which Moses stood and struck and water came out? so again, we, there's a connection so the stone jars are there which ordinarily no, not ordinarily, which always had water that was the purpose, they were water jars it's a wedding so the jars would have been almost empty because people came in and as they came in they used the water so they were empty our Lord, and there's only water kept in them our Lord said to them, fill this water jars with water so it's very clear there's water in the jars and they fill them to the brim they fill them to the brim so they were not full now again think of it you have this party, this wedding feast and the servants are there and they're going to fill the water pots to the brim where do they want to get the water? so they have to go down to the well and so you have this train of, 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 of servants carrying jugs because you can't carry this pot, this water stone jar it contained 30, 20 to 30 gallons so it's a big thing so you can't carry it so they'd be carrying these pots and pans and everything and this train of servants pouring in the water people are watching of course thinking well, what's going on in the world they would have looked at it, noticed it they wouldn't have thought much of it because it was normal to fill the jars with water they might have thought, well, why are they doing it now? why not wait until after? but as we know, we see something strange and we look at it and things strange just dismiss it, and that's probably what happened so when they'd done this, so they're witnesses to this, to what's going on there were the servants who carried the water the servants knew the jars were empty the servants knew now it was filled with water there were the guests who were seeing the servants fill it with water and when they'd done so, he says, draw, draw out now and take the chief steward the purpose of the master of ceremonies, the chief steward, was to stay sober so that he could direct the ceremonies of the wedding feast there's nothing worse than a drunk master of ceremonies because he's going to, stalk, he's going to start by speaking nonsense if, and that's as far as he's probably get so this one person for certain who was sober was the master of ceremonies and so they brought it to the chief steward he tasted it and he didn't know where it came from but since he's sober he has the authority to direct the ceremonies and he knows how things ought to be done and so he calls the bridegroom and is critical of him he said to him every man first gives good wine and when everybody is soused, when everybody's had plenty to drink you give them the bad because they, they won't be able to tell the difference but you've given the best wine now you've kept the good wine until this moment and not even the bridegroom knew where it came from he doesn't answer, he doesn't know in fact, St. John says the, no one knew where it came from except the servants and so this is the beginning of the miracles so our Lord works this miracle at a wedding feast and of course there's a whole theology that flows from this but in it we see that he uses what is available he doesn't create wine out of nothing 
but rather he uses water, which is common and ordinary, and he makes wine, and not just wine, but good wine out of it. He did it without saying a word. He did it without a prayer. He did it by his divine power, his will. And as he had changed the substance of water into that of wine, so later on he would change wine into his blood. So he would change bread into his body by an act of the will. And so he is manifesting his divinity very clearly. Not only that, 120, 180 gallons of wine well, it's hardly likely that they would drink, no matter how many guests you have, they would drink all of that wine that day. So there was wine left over. Just as when he multiplied the bread, there'd be bread left over. And so God uses the very circumstances that, of our life in which to manifest his glory, which is essentially the forgiveness of our sins, and our salvation. That's the glory of God. And he not only does this, but if we, like our Blessed Lady, leave everything in his hands and just trust him, you know, accept the water that is our life here on earth, accept it and present it to him, in faith, he changes it into the wine of eternal life. We're told then by St. John, this beginning of the miracles did Jesus in Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory that is his divinity so it's clear from this miracle that he was God and if he had worked if he had gone to to Jerusalem no doubt he would have worked a miracle comparable to this or even greater than this because he was showing his divinity now the purpose of Christ's miracles is always this to show his glory, who he is, God, in the flesh. And secondly, that what he says, what he teaches, is the truth. Because God will not, God works a miracle, he does something outside of nature to prove something that he has said in his human nature. Or what one of his servants, the prophets or the apostles, said. That's why he works the miracles. So when Peter was preaching in the, in the uh, temple, the man who was crippled from birth, he worked the miracle there. And that confirmed what Peter had said and what Peter was going to say, that Jesus of Nazareth is the Holy One. <laughs> and so this is his glory that he manifested. And what is the consequence? His disciples believed in him. Does that mean they didn't believe? No, it doesn't. Because when he called, when Andrew followed him with the other disciple, he believed. He went and found his brother Peter. We have found the one Moses spoke about. When James and John came, they believed. When he, Philip followed, Philip believed. And when Philip went and called Nathaniel, he said, we have found the one Moses wrote about. Jesus, Nazareth, can anything good come from that place? Come and see. Nathaniel came and he believed. So they believed. But their belief at the, up to that point was by hearsay. And we believe things by hearsay. But when he worked the miracle, when he allowed his glory to be seen, they no longer believe by hearsay. They believe because they saw. <coughs> and it's going to be like the woman at the well. When she went to the city and talked about our Lord, the people came out of the city of Sika and they, they asked our Lord to stay with them. He stayed two days, not three, two days. And they said to the woman, we believe because of what you said, but now we have heard him for ourselves and we truly believe that he is the Son of God. And so there are, here we see again, grades of belief. We believe because we hear but the more perfect way of believing is because we've seen for ourselves. 
And we can only see for ourselves if we trust God, accept the tribulations, difficulties, troubles of this day, knowing that God is in the midst of it, and that he will manifest his glory, and that he will answer our prayer. We have no wine except the wine from the true vine, Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary, the Son of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Santa Maria.